How's it going, everyone? Welcome back. I'm Bryce with Summit Community Church, and we are back in our series on trust. Happy New Year, and with the new year comes a lot of new resolutions, a lot of ideas of what the future might hold, and a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people look back over the last year on things that had gone wrong, things that happened, uh, maybe some loved ones lost, or some tests that were failed, or any circumstance and trial that life had for you. And you begin to think, where can I build a better foundation for a better next year? And that's really what we're focusing on. Last week we talked about, can you trust your Bible? We talked about how the Bible is made. We talked about um, uh, what Jesus says about building your life upon the firm foundation of Scripture versus building your life upon the sand. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at another element of trust. So we started with, can you trust your Bible? Now we're going to go with what it looks like to trust Jesus. Now, some people have grown up in church, and um, maybe some of us have trusted Jesus in times in our lives, and the payoff maybe didn't seem worth it. Maybe we were trusting God, we were following his ways, and we still lost the friend, or we still... Um, had significant consequences to things that had happened in the past, even though we would ask for forgiveness, trusted God, walk forward. Um, maybe it does really seem like you missed out on a fun time or you lost a relationship, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, because you, get, you didn't go do something or participate in something or because you, um, you affirmed God's way of life. You were building your life as best you could on that firm foundation. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't seem like it pays off. Or on the flip side... Um, you haven't built your life upon the firm foundation of God's word. You've been doing it your own way, and you have some, break, uh, some breaks, you have some bruises, you have some things in your life that are not exactly as you would like them, um, but you're not sure that God's way or Jesus' way is the right way. Will you get what you want? Um, what I love is that in the Old Testament, there are three books of wisdom. There is Proverbs, which basically uh, says... Uh, Trust God and you will prosper. Do life God's way and you will prosper. And Proverbs makes a lot of sense. You put a coin of faith in the vending machine and you get a product of faith out for you to consume. Uh, but then when we add the other two books of Old Testament wisdom, it kind of throws a wrench in that. Um, we have Job, which says, trust God, follow God, and you will suffer greatly. Um, Job, uh, we're not going to go into Job today, but Job shows us the story of a man who was righteous, who was good, yet suffered and lost regardless of his righteousness and his goodness. Um, and then you have Ecclesiastes, which is kind of in between the two. And it, Ecclesiastes is a teacher who's writing towards the end of his life. And he's saying, I have been wise and it didn't really pay off. I've watched people be foolish and it looked like it paid off. I have seen good men die. I've seen bad men prosper. Um, he's like, I've been overly religious and righteous and I didn't get the return that I expected. But then I've also partied hard and had a good time. And that also did not bring meaning into my life. And it's really a man's search for meaning. And he comes to this, like the only thing that has lasting value is trust God obey his commandments, um, because that's the only thing that will actually have meaning in your life. All else is a vapor, he's saying. All else is just a wisp of cloud. So <clears throat> sitting in that wisdom and, and how all of those books kind of play out, I want to walk forward through a story of two boat wrecks, two shipwrecks. And so we're going to be in Matthew 14, 22 through 23. This is one of my all-time favorite stories. Uh, but to give you the setup, uh, Jesus tells his disciples to go across a sea, and he said, I will catch up to you later. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll catch you on the other side, or I'll catch up to you guys later. So the disciples get in the boat, and they begin to take off, and um, the waves are a little rough. There's a little bit of a storm going on, and they look out, and it looks like walking over the water is a ghost. And here's why. A lot of people believed that the uh, that, that what was at the bottom of a sea would be just the underworld, would be death. And so this was kind of a, a popular superstition at the time. So they said, is it a ghost? And, uh, and we'll read it here. We'll read it now. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. When he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. 
Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So, what we're going to use this element for to teach us about Jesus and our walk with God is that Peter has incredible faith. He sees Jesus walking on the water, and he says, Jesus, is that you? Yes, it's you. Um, instead of just saying, wow, that's so cool, look, my rabbi, my master, uh, my professed savior is walking on water. Not only that, but he is also, as he's walking on water, he's proclaiming in their minds his victory over death. Are you a ghost? No, it's Jesus walking over what they think leads to the underworld. Jesus is mastery over death. Jesus is mastery over water, his mastery over creation. It's truly, you are the son of God. But Peter goes one further. Peter says, Lord, can I join you? It wasn't enough for him just to sit back in awe. He said, I want to take part in what God is doing. I want to take part in that faith, literal faith walk with Jesus. And so Peter cries out, Lord, can I, can I, come, like, can I come out there? If it's you, let me come out there. Jesus says, all right, come on in, you know, come on out. What's interesting is it says the wind is kind of tough. The waves are kind of crazy. Um, and if you've ever been on a boat, uh, when the boat starts rocking, it doesn't take much to get that boat moving to, to try to trouble the, the wind and the sea. Um, and so it's, a, it, it's very much one of the situations where things are kind of intense on the sea. It's not necessarily like a big storm, lightning crashing. There's another place in scripture where they're like, we're going to die in the storm. Uh, that's not this situation. But the water itself is troubling. Water in scripture usually symbolizes chaos. And so um, notice when we go to Genesis chapter 1, it says God was hovering over the face of the deep. And out of the chaos, out of the darkness, he brings light, he brings land, he brings order, he brings category, and he asks man to name it. So what we're seeing in Genesis is that water is chaos, and out of chaos comes God's order, God's design. In your life, you're going to have chaos you're going to have uncertainty. You're going to think about doing something and you're not sure how it's going to turn out. Nothing is for certain. Tomorrow is not promised. And that's what we are facing, much like Peter in our lives, is when we step out in faith, when we step out into the world, you get outside of the walls of this church. And let's be honest, even inside the wall of this church as you're meeting your friends, you're meeting new people, you're playing fun, exciting games, but you don't know what's in store for you. Um, you are stepping into a sea of uncertainty, a sea of chaos, and the waves hit against you and the wind blows. And time after time, we see in our lives that trouble comes and trouble comes and trouble comes. Waves beat. Uh, life is tough. Get a helmet, they used to say when I was in high school. Life's tough, get a helmet. But um, so as Peter's facing all of this, he steps out in faith. And so we tell people, if you'll give your life to Jesus, if you'll follow Jesus and do life God's way, um, now notice last week we said it is like building your house upon a rock that when storms come and, and waves beat and wind blows that your house will stand. Unlike building your house upon the sand where when the storms come and the wind blows your house will crumble and it will fall. Notice he says storms will still come. You will still be in your strong foundation of a house as wind is blowing, waves are beating, and things seem intense, the storms still come. And so um, we think if we will follow Jesus, if we'll step out and follow God, that the moment Peter sets his foot on the water, that all those waves just turn to glass. They just turn to a solid foundation 
of a clear floor sea. We think that the wind will just die down and go from gusts to a gentle breeze across his skin and that Peter will keep his eyes on Jesus and he will walk towards Jesus on this calm, still water. So if you're having trouble in your life, there's issues at home, there's issues at school, there's issues with friends, and people say, listen, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except through him. Give your life to Jesus. It's a better way to live. Some people get that twisted. They think, well, I will give my life to God and everything will be okay. Nothing will go wrong. All my problems will be solved. I had a friend who was a dear friend of mine. We worked together for many years. And every time I would talk about God, he would drop a few swear words and say that he hated God. Um, but over time, I would just have lunch with him. I would invite him to Christmas parties at my house. Um, he was there for the birth of some of my kids. Um, I looked, we worked together. I looked out for him at work. He looked out for me at work. And eventually, he came to church with me. And just the first time he was at church, he broke into tears. Uh, he stood for an altar call. And afterwards, I took him out for ice cream, Baskin Robbins. And uh, I began to talk to him and say, hey, man, what's going on? And he said, my life is not good. Things are not going good. You see, he had lived his entire life partying, uh, just doing drugs, drinking, just having a good old time in every way that you can imagine. And he was miserable and he was suffering because as I've told you guys, time and time again, I'm going to say it almost every week, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. And in his life, he had stayed too long. He had paid too much. He had gone too far. He did not, he was not enjoying life and he wanted off of this crazy train that he had put himself on. And he said, man, I need something better. I need something uh, I just need to turn my life around. And I said, man, I'm so happy. Jesus is absolutely how you do that. But can I promise you something? Can I promise you something? The storms won't stop. The storms will keep coming. But what you will have is you'll have an anchor in those storms that when death and loss come, you will find meaning, that you will find beauty. As scripture says, you bring beauty from ashes. Um, it, so I was promising him like, hey, listen, don't think that this is just a get out of jail free card by following God, that nothing bad will happen. I said, if you will start reading the Bible, you will see that the followers of God are highly, highly persecuted. Jesus says you will have trouble in this life, but take heart because I've overcome the world. He didn't say you won't have any trouble in this life because I've overcome the world. He, will says, he says you will have trouble in this life, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Jesus says um, if they hate you, know that they hated me first. Um, so we will absolutely face persecution. We will absolutely go through hard times. People, as you get older and older, will die. Uh, they'll get sick. They will be lost. There will be divorce uh, amongst your, you know, unfortunately friends or family or whatever. Bad things will still happen. So this is not promising that when you take a leap of faith and you follow God and you step out on the chaos, uh, uh, a sea of life, that everything will be good, that everything will be great. I want to point out that when Jesus got back and Peter got back into the boat, it says, it says, Peter got down out of the boat, walked, okay, here he goes. Immediately Jesus reached out, caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, and when they climbed into the boat, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Can't help but think, Jesus, why couldn't you calm the wind down? while he was on the water, walking in faith. Jesus, I have given you my life. I have dedicated myself to you. Why? Why couldn't you calm the storm while I took the leap of faith? In fact, I, I would argue that it was much easier if Peter had just watched Jesus, been in awe, worshipped his majesty. Wow, you truly are like the others. They said, truly you are the son of God. Like if he had stayed in the boat, he was just like, truly you are the son of God. But Peter did the harder thing. He said, God, I want to be out there with you. I want to be out there with you. I want to be on the sea. I want to be with you on the water, in the waves. And here's where Peter, here's what built Peter's faith. Because as he chose the harder thing, here's what built his faith. He kept his eyes on Jesus. L listen to this. It says, Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind... He was afraid and began to sink. 
Peter saw the wind. He saw the waves. He saw the storm. He saw the uncertainty. He saw the chaos. He saw death, because that's really what the sea represented. And he began to sink. In your life, have you trusted God? Have you come to church and had a good time, enjoyed our cereal bar, uh, played some games with us, grown up in church through children's ministry, doing fun dances and songs and reading the Bible? But then it got real. But then you had a, a situation out in the real world that, that, that your faith was tested, that you were tested. The circumstances came, a storm came. Was it the death of a grandparent around COVID? Was it uh, just extreme depression and anxiety amongst all the quarantines? Was it an issue with a boyfriend or a girlfriend who betrayed you or let you down? Um, was it the loss of friends or someone moved away or you moved and left all your friends behind? What was your situation, but was your faith tested? And when you were young, for some of us, when you were young, you kept your eyes on Jesus. And the Bible, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? Um, that that you, just, you just kept your eyes fixed on Jesus. That church was fun. It was a good time. The Bible was maybe a time for some families where your family gathered around. And it was maybe one of the only times that your family had a deeper connection. But now it's real. And you look at the wind, you look at the storms, you look at the circumstances, you've seen loss, you've seen death, you've seen trouble, you've seen pain, and you begin to sink. Because you take your eyes off Jesus, you begin to sink. For Peter, sinking would have meant falling into the underworld, giving over to death. Depression, anxiety, these things can feel like that. It can feel like falling into the underworld, falling into a deep, dark place. No, that's not to say if you were just a better Christian that it would solve all your mental health issues. No, the mind is a physical organ uh, producing hormones and needs to be treated rightly. Honestly, some of us just drink too many energy drinks, stay up way too late and swipe too much on TikTok and wreck our brains with all that dopamine. But either way, if you will add Jesus to your life, anchor your life in him, build your life upon his rock and foundation, then in those storms, you will have an anchor your suffering will have meaning. You will say, this storm is just here. Jesus will get me through. I will live past this, that I was created for a purpose, beautifully and wonderfully made, and that God has a plan for me, plans to prosper and not harm me, plans to move forward through this storm. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And when the storms come, when loss comes, when pain comes, say, I see you, Jesus. Wind and waves, wind and waves. In my life, I had a lot of storms come up. When I was a little boy, I had a lot going on in my life. My home life was kind of fraught with chaos. Uh, my relationship with my brothers would sometimes be severely tested. Um, we just went through a lot as a family. And as I went through these things, as I was suffering, I dove deeper into scripture and into the Bible. And as I did, you know what? My home life didn't get better. School life didn't get better. Friendships, relationships didn't get better. Nothing got cleaned up and easy going and everything was peaceable and it was Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. It wasn't that way. But here's what I had. I had meaning and I had hope and I had reason and Jesus shined a light through me. And what I began to realize is I turned my eyes off of me and I began to look to others. And as I saw others, they were suffering. They were in chaos. They were uncertain. They were looking for an anchor. And I began to tell them, look, 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 come here. Jesus is our anchor. Jesus is our firm foundation. You can trust him, follow him, read his word. He gave me hope. And he didn't just give me hope. He made me a source of hope through others as Jesus shined his hope through me. That's what we can ask for in life. Happiness is not a right. Happiness is not guaranteed. Life is difficult. This world is fraught with sin. And I read the end of the Bible and tell you what, guys, it's only going to get worse. Things around here, there will be wars and rumors of war. There will be famines. There will be what looks like very much in some depictions of Revelation, possibly a nuclear holocaust. There will be a lot of bad things coming our way. So I promise you, suffering will come. Pain will come. But in the night, joy comes in the morning, the scripture says. You can trust Jesus. So I'm going to end us with, with one more story. One more story. You see... Jesus says to Peter, he says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
it's interesting because he looks at Peter and he speaks to Peter, but no one else got out in the water with him. So like, that's not fair, right? But, but Jesus looks at Peter, he speaks to Peter. He didn't say to the others, oh, you of little faith, why didn't you join Peter out here on the water? No, no, no. He, he turns his attention to Peter and he speaks to Peter directly. And he says, Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I would have expected Jesus to say, Peter, you of immense faith. You are the only human being to walk on water besides Jesus, who's also fully God, fully man. Peter, you're going to be the only human being in all of human history to ever have enough faith to walk on water. Thank you for, for stepping out in faith, keeping your eyes on me and walking towards me. But he didn't just pat Peter on the head. He gave him a greater lesson. Later on, Jesus tells Peter, Satan's looking for you. He wants to tear you apart and sift you like wheat. But he says, I'm going to build my rock upon you, Peter. That's why Peter's name, Simon, was changed to Peter, which translates literally to rock. Jesus changed his name to rock. He called him Rocky. Listen, rock. <laughs> so here's another story. It's, uh, it's a short one. I'll give you the, the cliff notes of it. In Acts, um, in the book of Acts, Peter, or, uh, Paul, a different apostle, He's on his way to Rome to be tried and executed. And on the way, uh, a storm hits, a storm much bigger than some troubled waves. We saw with, with Peter, it was like, it said, it said, where is it? Um, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. It says, Peter got down on the boat, walked in water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, it didn't say he saw the lightning, he saw the tsunami, he saw the end of the apocalypse, all the, like, the, the other storm that we have uh, elsewhere in scripture where the disciples are like, we're going to die, the boat is sinking. The other people in the boat were fine, they were just transfixed on Jesus and what Peter was doing. So life has chaos, not to downplay it, Peter did something amazing, but Paul's storm was so intense it broke the boat. He is floating on pieces of boat as he goes to the nearest island, which is called Malta. All the other soldiers and people on the boat, he, he helps get them to sea. He starts making a fire. A viper jumps out and bites him on the hand. And Peter's response to that is to shake off the snake, go back to building a fire. And he writes, the people at Malta were so friendly. We shared the gospel. Good things happened. The people thought that he was going to die because of the snake bite. And then they thought he was a god because the snake didn't kill him. And he was like, no, 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 let me, let me teach you about God. Let me use this as an opportunity. You see, Peter or Paul went out, they're both peace. Paul went out into the chaos of life. He was met with heartache. His boat, his storms broke his boat. Elsewhere in scripture, Paul says like, I've been flogged. I've been beaten. I've been stoned. I've been imprisoned. I've been shipwrecked. I've been bitten by snakes. I've been betrayed. Paul goes through all of his ailments elsewhere in scripture. He tells about everything that has gone bad to him. But here is his faith, and here's what Jesus wanted Peter to see. Where Peter failed, Paul succeeded. And Peter would later get this message, but it's, it's perfectly summed up by, by Paul in this boat situation, because it's boat and boats. Your boat will break. Can I promise you something? Your boat will break. And when you're out on sea, when you're out in a storm, you put your feet firmly on a boat, that boat is your foundation. That boat is something flat that you can stand on when everything else is, is, is topsy-turvy, when everything else is, is, is moving about and sloshing. A boat is a foundation, but your foundation will break. Your boat will break. What are some boats in your life? Is it a friendship? Is it a relationship? Is it a sport? Is it a, is it a, a, a uh, identity that you claim for yourself? Is it good grades? Is it a hope of a future college and future career? Can I promise you something? Some of you will go work those careers and wind up in a dead-end job. Some of you will have your dream career come true and you will go, is this it? This is everything I wanted and I'm still miserable. Some of you will have amazing relationships and those relationships will end. Some of you will have amazing friendships and those friendships will move away. Um, 
there, there is, uh, some of you, like my brother, was a star athlete, an amazing athlete. God's gift to man for an athlete. Then he takes one wrong step on the football field, shreds his ACL, and all of his college football dreams, done. He would never play football again. Some of you have, uh, will have sports injuries. You will have things in your life that you will think, this is me. This is my identity. This is my foundation. And you will find those foundations despite all your other storms. You can have issues at home, and you're like, I'm going to turn to sports. You can have issues at sports and at home, and you're like, I'm going to turn to this core relationship. You can have issues with that core relationship at home and in sports. And so you think, I'm just going to turn to hedonism and party and having fun, and I'm just going to find joy in the fun. That's going to be my foundation. That's going to be what settles me when things are wrong. I just need a new boyfriend. I just need a new girlfriend. I just need a new video game. I just need a new sport. I just need better grades. I just need to graduate high school or middle school and then everything will be different. That next grade will be so much better. I just, I just, Isaiah 43 11 says, I, yes, I alone am the Lord and there is no savior beside me. As you build your foundation on these boats, on these boats amid chaos, and you think this is a boat, this is a boat, this is a boat, that boat will break, that boat will sink. And Jesus was inviting Peter to have the faith of Paul. He was inviting Peter to have the faith of Paul. Paul, his boat broke. He's got his eyes on Jesus. You see, here's the greater faith. Peter needed to walk on water to join Jesus. He needed to see a miracle. He needed to see that he could do something miraculous, that he could experience God in a very physical, tangible, real way, and it wasn't enough. Peter had the miracle of walking on water, and it wasn't enough. The waves still distracted him. Even while he was looking at Jesus walking on water, he took his eyes off of Jesus onto his circumstance and fell. Even with the miracle of walking on water, it was not enough. Paul worked a greater miracle. Because Paul didn't need to walk on water. Paul didn't need to not get bitten by a snake. Paul didn't need to not be in chains and in prison. Paul said, I found in my life in all things to be content. I've had a lot. I've had a little. I've been hungry. I've been fed. But I have found that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Quite a different take on that verse, isn't it, when you put it in context. Paul had the miraculous faith to sink, to swim, to be bitten, to be shipwrecked, to be cold, to be in the fire. And he said, my life has a purpose. My life has a direction that even in chains facing execution, he said, until I'm gone, God has something for me. Until I'm gone, until the world takes me, until death earns me, I have a purpose. I have a calling. My life has meaning. Students, keep your eyes upon Jesus. No boat will save you. You don't need a boat. You don't even need to walk on water. You just need to keep your eyes on Jesus. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Last week, we talked about can you trust your Bible? I showed you how the Bible is a miraculous document. That if you just put it on an Excel sheet with all the other ancient texts, that it will look like an error. It will stand out as a glaring piece of history. And you'll go, why is the data wrong here? Because it's three, five, ten times better than all the other documents on the list. There must be a problem. You can trust your Bible. Today, I ask you to trust Jesus. To keep your eyes on Jesus in the midst of a storm. Storms will come. Have the faith to walk with God in that storm. Have the faith to stay strong. To keep your eyes on Jesus. In our lives, as our boats break, you won't necessarily walk on water like Peter. You'll swim like Paul. But my question to you and the challenge today is, will you sink or will you swim? Will you keep your eyes on Jesus? It's not built on your, on, on your ability to be good or righteous. It's not built on your ability to earn it. Here's all Peter needed to do. Keep his eyes on Jesus. Here's all Paul did. Keep his eyes on Jesus. Even when Jesus wasn't physically in front of him, he couldn't physically see him. Jesus was no longer in human form, physically, bodily on earth, but he had ascended to heaven. He was technically omnipresent everywhere. But 
He said, I trust that Jesus is with me wherever I go, that I will get it to shore, that I will take up snakes, be bitten and not be harmed, that we'll spread the word of God. Students, accept this challenge. Keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, God, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray that you keep our eyes turned firmly on you. God, I pray that as storms come in life, God, that we don't bunker down, hide, and say, God, when the storm is over, I will serve you. God, when the storm is over, I will trust you. God, when you send me another boat, I'll be okay. Lord, just send me another boat. Send me another friend. Send me another exciting thing to turn my eyes to. But Lord, I pray that we build within us the faith to say we don't need a boat. We don't need to walk on water. We just need to see you. To see your purpose in our lives like Paul saw your purpose in his life. To believe that our suffering has meaning. And Lord, you say in Hebrews, these all died in faith, having not received what was promised, but welcoming it far off as citizens of a greater kingdom, a higher kingdom. Therefore, you are not ashamed to be called their God. Lord, give us that faith. Give us that perspective. Give us that trust. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, Summit.